Good morning. Good morning. Let's open this prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this beautiful Palm Sunday. We thank you for this Easter season as we celebrate Jesus' death and resurrection. We thank you so much that he was willing to go to the cross and have his body broken and his blood shed so we can be forgiven for our sins. And Heavenly Father, we just ask that you will forgive us for our sins and help us to be made right with you so we can have everlasting life with you. Now, Heavenly Father, go with us as we continue our study in Genesis, as we go into chapter 3. Help us to learn something maybe that we've never known before. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, chapter 2, last Sunday, we went into more depth about the creation of uh, man. We know that um, God formed uh, man out of the dust of the ground. He breathed life into him, and he became a living soul. And God knew that it would not be good for man to be by himself. So he needed somebody like him. Mm -hmm. And so he put Adam to sleep, and he took a rib from Adam's side, and he made Eve from that rib. Uh, and then today we are going to go into chapter 3. Uh, and some people have said that this is probably the most important chapter in the Bible. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you think about it, read chapters 1 and 2. Skip 3 and read chapters 4 through 11. If you do that, you think, what happened? Because in 1 and 2, we see that man is in fellowship with God. He is innocent. He knows no sin. Um, everything is perfection. There is fellowship with God. You know, man and God would walk in the cool of the morning. And then if you look in chapter 4, we start with jealousy, anger, murder, lying, wickedness, corruption, rebellion, and judgment. So you go from a perfect, beautiful world to all of this bad stuff. And if you didn't read chapter 3, you don't know what happened. Um, so what did happen? You know, what caused the different, the drastic difference between chapter 2 and chapter 4? Well, originally, man was made to be created in the image of God. He was to be living in union with God and to rule over all creation. And Adam and Eve's failure in this task is their sin, which we also know we know is a fall of man. And when we say man in all these places, we're not just talking about the male. We're talking about male and female, mankind as a whole. Um, and this didn't have just consequences for Adam and Eve. It also brought about repercussions for all of the human race for all time. So when Adam and Eve sinned, they became enslaved to sin in a sense. And then when they brought forth children into the world, their sin were also brought into this slavery or bondage from sin. Paul says in Romans 5 that through one man sin entered into the world. And by this one man, death was brought into the world. Um, and in chapter 3, we find the divine explanation of the present fallen and ruined condition of our world. We learn of the subtle devices of our enemy, the devil. We behold the utter powerless, powerlessness of man to walk in the path of righteousness when divine grace is up, withheld from him. We discover the spiritual effects of sin, man seeking to flee from God. We discern the attitude of God toward the guilty sinner, and we mark the universal tendency of human nature to cover its own moral shame by a device of man's own making. Here we are taught of the gracious provision which God has made to meet our great need, and here we learn that God cannot approach that man cannot approach God except through a mediator, and of course the mediator is the Lord Jesus Christ. So. Everything bad in the world, um, every all sin, all misery, all violence, all illness, all tragedy, all war, everything bad that comes about can be traced back to this fateful encounter between the first human beings and Satan back in the Garden of Eden. Uh, so, verse 1. 
Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? Uh, if we go back to chapters 1 and 2, we find that man was created innocent, but he was not created righteous. Righteousness is innocence that has been maintained in the presence of temptation. Um, temptation is either going to destroy you or it's going to develop you. The Garden of Eden was not a hot house. It wasn't perfect conditions all the time. And man was not a hot house plant that was in perfect conditions all the time. Uh, so character has to be developed and it can only be developed in the presence of temptation. Man didn't create himself. God created him. And so man is God's creature. And it was right for him to lay down any um, restrictions or uh, things that he wanted to. And he, he gave man one. He said, But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat of it. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. Now, this tree was not the only tree in the Bible. There were plenty of other trees that had food. So, Adam wasn't going to starve to death if he didn't get to eat from this one tree. And he was warned, if you eat of it, you're going to die. So, it wasn't Adam's need to eat from that tree. It was his choice to eat from that tree. And in the first verse, we are introduced to the serpent. Um, and we think, okay, well, where did he come from? You know, how did he get in the Garden of Eden? Well, we're not told. You know, the Bible doesn't tell us everything about every subject, about every question we may ask. In the first place, we're not supposed to know everything. And in the second place, can you imagine how big the Bible would be? If it went into every detail about every little thing. On the very first Sunday that we, we studied and, and the, the, the guy said, uh, you know, brevity, brevity. Mm -hmm. And he said, well, remember the story of creation was 200 and some works. He said, yeah, and if they, if they had just put just a few hundred more, uh -huh. we wouldn't have so many questions. Right. But, <laughs> uh -huh. but for everything, faith, you've got to have this ultimately... Mm -hmm. Same thing with, mm -hmm. with mm -hmm. what was happening here. Yeah. I'm going to either trust God uh -huh. and know that he's right, uh -huh. or I'm not, mm -hmm. and I'm going to go my own way. Right, yeah. And, and that's been our choice from that, uh -huh. from the time God said, from the tree of knowledge, mm -hmm. of good and evil, you're not to eat. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we had a choice. Mm -hmm. We made the wrong one. And they ate it. <laughs> Thank you, Adam and Eve. Um, but anyway, we know that the serpent is the devil here. Um, we don't know how long Adam and Eve had been in the garden before he, uh, Satan appeared to them. And we don't know if Satan took possession of a snake's body or he just assumed the form of a snake. Um, but we do know that he was in heaven at one time. He rebelled against God. He was thrown down to earth. Uh, and then somehow he ended up in the Garden of Eden, and the serpent was a creature that could be used of Satan, and Satan used him, just like he'll use us in a heartbeat if we don't look out for him. Uh, verse 2, the woman said to the serpent, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it or you will die. So we ask the question, well, why did the serpent approach Eve? Why didn't he go to Adam? Well, when, at, when God created Adam, he told him that he could eat of every tree of the garden, but not this one that was in the middle of the garden. Well, Eve was created after that. She wasn't there listening to the conversation with God telling Adam not to eat of this tree because she was created after that. Mm -hmm. So she got her information secondhand. She got it from Adam. Well, maybe she thought, well, Adam misunderstood. He didn't know what he's talking about. Or, uh, well, maybe it was, maybe Adam wasn't supposed to eat it, but it's okay for me to eat it. So 
the serpent approached woman first. And Dr. McGee says, I think that woman was created finer than man. She had more compassion and sympathy in her makeup. She was probably more open to suggestions than the man. I think a woman has a nature that is more inquisitive than a man's. She is the one today who goes into the cults and isms more than anyone else and a lot of times leads men into them. In fact, many of the founders of cults and isms have been women. But Satan knew what he was doing. And he had a very subtle message or method as he came. He asked her this question which cast doubt on the word of God. Did God say that you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? He raises a doubt in her mind and excites her curiosity. And she answered, well, we can eat of all the trees, but this tree, God has told us, you shall not eat from it or you will die. If you touch it, we will die. What did Eve do? She added, she added to it. God didn't say anything about it. If you touch it, you'll die. But she added that. And we have been warned in the Bible, don't add to it, don't mm. subtract to it. Right. And Eve added to it. Verses uh, 4 and 5. You will not certainly die, the serpent said to the woman. For God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So basically he was saying, oh, you're not going to die. That's ridiculous. That's impossible. Uh, he questions the love of God and the goodness of God. If God is good, why did he give you this restriction? And he may have even said, if God didn't want you to eat it, why did he put it there? <laughs> um, the serpent implies that God is not righteous when he says you will not die. And he questions the holiness of God by saying, you're going to be God yourselves. For God knows that when you eat it, then your eyes will be opened and you will be as gods knowing good and evil. The, one, uh, the serpent suggested to the woman that God had not really forbidden the fruit for her good, but was rather keeping good from her. Um, and the serpent, Satan, very subtly contradicts God, and he substitutes his word for God's word. And he does the same today, doesn't he? How many religions go through the Bible and just say, well, this is, this is not right. You know, this is the way it should be. They change. They, they add to. They take away from. They change. Um, and this is one reason that we really need to read and study the Bible. We need to know what the Bible says because if we don't know what the Bible says, then we're not going to know if somebody's telling us an untruth or not. Verse 6. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some of it and ate. She also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. So notice the appeal that the servant made. He, he made it in a threefold way. First, it was an appeal to the, f the flesh. The tree was good for food. We like good food, don't we? Um, second, it was a psychological appeal to the part of man, to his mind. It was pleasant to the eyes. Um, we like to see pretty things, don't we? You know, we see pretty things and it makes us happy. It puts us in a good mood. And it was also an appeal to the religious side of man. It was a tree to be desired to make one wise, to be like God. And you'll find that this is the exact temptation that Satan brought to Jesus in the wilderness after his baptism. First of all, he said to Jesus, make these stones into bread. That was an appeal to the flesh, you know, get something good to eat. Then Satan showed the Lord the kingdoms of the world and offered them to him. That was an appeal to the mind. Hmm, I can, I can control all of this and be king of the world. And then finally, he said, cast yourself down from the temple. And that was an appeal to the religious side. And the devil, you know, hasn't changed his tactics he is using the same tactics with us as he used on Adam and Eve in the garden. And he uses them because they still work. We still listen to them and we still fall for his same old line. And a lot of times we give in. John wrote, 
For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but it is of this world. The lust of the flesh, that is, the tree was good to eat. The pride of the, um, the lust of the flesh, the tree was good to eat. The lust of the eyes, it was good to look at. And the pride of life, it was desired to make one wise. Jesus said that these sins of the flesh come out of the heart of man, way down deep. And this is where Satan is making his appeal. This is a method that he is using in order that he might reach in and lead mankind astray. And he succeeded. They were told that they would know good and evil. And what happened? We see the results of their choice. We see the results of the fall of man in verse 7. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they realized they were naked. So they showed, sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. And when it says that uh, the eyes of both of them were opened, this means that they had gotten a conscience now. Um, before the fall, man did not have a conscience. He was innocent. Innocence is ignorance of evil. What is the saying? Ignorance is bliss. We're happy. Mm -hmm. sure. <laughs> Sometimes when we don't know things, um, their bliss is gone because they're not ignorant anymore. Mm -hmm. um, and we all have a conscience. It is an accuser that each one of us has living on the inside of us. Um, guilt complex is very powerful, isn't it? Oh, man, parents really know how to use it on their kids. <laughs> <laughs> and we do something wrong, that, that nagging, oh, man, I shouldn't have done that. That was wrong. Not going to do that anymore. But then what happens? That passes and we do it, probably do it again anyway. But, but that guilt complex is God made into us. You know, he put into us. So we, you know, we, we know what's right and wrong, and we should feel bad when we do wrong. Mm -hmm. So the knowledge of good and evil was achieved by the rejection of good and the embracing of evil. They knew they were naked, so they sewed fig leaves together to cover themselves. Have you ever noticed that the fig tree is the only tree that is specifically mentioned in, in these chapters? Um, it's the only one that says what the name of the tree is, what type of tree it is. And the knowledge of good and evil is always pictured as an apple tree. You know, you, you see Eve holding the forbidden fruit, and it's an apple. Mm -hmm. It was probably not an apple. Scripture does not say anywhere that it was an apple tree. Um, the Hebrew word peri, P-E-R-I, that is used in this uh, scripture is a generic word for fruit. Mm -hmm. So it, it is not apple. We don't know what it is. They have, of course, scholars have discussed it and they have answered and asked questions and done research. and. And they say, maybe it might have been big, the fig tree. You know, they might have took the fruit and then they might have got the leaves off of the same tree. Um, but they actually said that apple was never a consideration to be the forbidden fruit. That's just something that man has come up with. Um, but the fig leaves concealed, but they didn't really cover up. Adam and Eve didn't confess. They just attempted to cover up their sin. Sin doesn't go away unless you deal with it. You, just, you can't keep covering it up. you just got to deal with it. And this is the same condition of man today in religion sometimes. He goes through exercises and rituals. He joins churches. He becomes very religious. In his temptation, Satan wanted to come between man's soul and God. In other words, he wanted to wean man from God, to win man over to himself, and to become the God of man. Um... So Eve saw that the tree was good for food, it was pleasant to the eye, and it was desired to make one wise. So Satan works from the outside to the inside. But God begins with man's heart. Religion is something you rub on the outside, but God does not begin with religion. Christianity is not a religion. Christianity is a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, you know, we can be religious about it. A lot of things, can't we? Some people are religious about their exercise routine and eating healthy. Uh, obviously, I'm not one of those. But uh, you can be you can be religious about 
Islam. I guess you can probably be even religious mm -hmm. about being an atheist. Um, mm -hmm. But, and look at Judas. You know, Judas was an apostle of Jesus. He mm -hmm. was a treasurer of the group. Mm -hmm. And what did he do? He betrayed Jesus. Mm -hmm. So he may have, and, and even in the, the thing Friday night when he did his monologue, he said, I was a fake. I was never saved. But I looked good. I looked like I was religious. Oh. And people, people can look religious, you know. It's you can't look on the their outside. You got to look on their heart, and, and God can. God is the one that does that. Mm -hmm. um, think about the Pharisees back in Jesus's day. They were very religious on the outside, but what did they do? They were jealous of Jesus. They had him crucified. Mm -hmm. God's son. You, they, they said they loved God so much, and they had all these rules and regulations. And then they had a son killed. Mm -hmm. So they looked good on the outside, but they were rotten on the inside. So uh, Adam and Eve, instead of confessing their sin, sewed the leaves together as a covering. And men are still going to church and going through religious exercises and good works instead of confessing the sins of their heart. And again, you have to deal with your sin. Verses 8 and 9. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man, Where are you? Religion will separate you from God, and Adam is lost. Adam is lost, and it is God seeking him, and not man seeking God. God's search for man is pictured all the way through Scripture. Paul wrote in Romans, There is none that seeketh after God. Jesus said, You have not chosen me, but I have chosen you. And John said, We love him because he first loved us. God seeks out man, and he offers man salvation. It all begins with God. It does not begin with us. Um, verses 10 through 12. He answered, I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. And he said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? The man said, The woman you put here with me, she gave me some fruit from the tree, and I ate it. So Adam never says he did anything wrong. He never says he made the wrong choice. He never says, I shouldn't have done it. He never says, I shouldn't have ate it, and I shouldn't have let Eve make it, eat it. Um, what did he do? He passed the blame. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, he blamed woman. Mm -hmm. But you know, he also blamed God, mm -hmm. the woman that you gave me. Oh. <laughs> so he, he, he was basically blaming God and woman. Mm -hmm. I never admitted that he did wrong. And then in verse 13, Then the Lord said to woman, What is this you have done? The woman said, the serpent deceived me, and I ate. What did she do? Blame. blame the serpent. Mm -hmm. Again, she never says, I did something wrong. I made the wrong decision. I sinned. Mm -hmm. More butt passing. We do that sometimes, don't we? It's easier to blame somebody else than, than admit it ourselves. Um, verse 14. So the Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and all wild animals. You will crawl on your belly and you will eat dust all the days of your life. So the serpent is not the same slithering creature that we know of today. He was different at the beginning and there has now been pronounced upon him this judgment from God. So probably the snake was an upright, erect, walking animal. It was only after God cursed him that he became a slithering, on the ground serpent. Um, and do you ever wonder, Eve didn't seem freaked out by a snake talking to her? Maybe all the animals talked back in the Garden of Eden. Maybe some of them talked. We don't know. But maybe that is something that they lost in the fall, because. Animals and the, the whole world suffered because of it, not just people. So maybe that was something that was taken away from them. Um, verse 15, And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. 
So God is saying, I will put enmity between you, Satan, and the woman, Mary, and between thy seed and her seed. Um, enmity, of course, means hatred, hostility, just not getting along. And notice it says her seed. It doesn't say man's seed because this was a virgin birth. There was no man biologically responsible for Jesus' conception. Um, and this is a, and when it says about a bruising head and bruising heel, uh, that is referring to Jesus' crucifixion and death that Satan basically influenced. Uh, and then it's also talking about Jesus' final victory over Satan. But this is a long, continual struggle between good and evil. Um, Jesus said, You are of your father the devil, and the lust of your father you will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. So Jesus made the distinction between the children of God and the children of Satan. And there is a conflict and a struggle between these two. Um, it started in the Garden of Eden. It's going on now. It will continue to go on until Jesus comes back and, and rids the world of evil and make, makes all things right. Every man must face temptation and must win his own battle. Before Christ came, the victory was through obedience and faith, and after Christ came, we are to identify ourselves with Christ through faith. So to be saved means that we are in Christ. Man was uh, one of three orders of creation. God created angels, he created man, and he created animals. Well, animals were given no choice, but angels and mankind were the angels. A third of the angels made their choice when they sided with Satan and were thrown out of heaven. In here, Genesis chapter 3, man made his choice. He made a decision, and he has been held responsible for the decision he has made. And again, that just didn't affect Adam and Eve. It has affected every person born since, and will continue every person born since, again, till Jesus sets things right. Verse 16, to the woman he said, I will make your pains and child, childbearing very severe. With painful labor you will give birth to children. Your desire will be for your husband and he will rule over you. So here is God's judgment on woman. She cannot bring a child into the world without pain and sorrow. And isn't it interesting that the very thing that brings so much joy in life and continues the human family has to come through pain and sorrow. And not only that, she is, the man is over her. Man is to be the head of the family, just as Christ is the head of the church. And then 17, to Adam he said, Because you listened to your wife and ate fruit from the tree about which I commanded you, you must not eat from it. Cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil you will eat food from it all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your brow you will eat your food until you return to the ground, since from it you were taken, for dust you are, and to dust you will return. So from this point on, uh, Adam would be forced to find his own food and his own shelter, and he would have to fight weeds and thistles to eke out an existence from the ground. And then verse 20, Adam named his wife Eve because she would become the mother of all the living. Um, okay, let me go back. I wanted to say something else about uh, this is the judgment of man. Uh, and so not only does he have him to, to make his own living now, death has always also come upon him. Uh, and there are two kinds of death. There is a physical death, which is when our physical body dies and the soul, the spirit is released to return to God. And Ecclesiastes says, Then shall the dust return to the earth as it was, and the Spirit shall return unto God who gave it. Man must ultimately answer to God. Don't care if you're saved. Don't care if you're lost. One day you're going to stand before him and answer for yourself. But Adam didn't die physically the day that he ate. He didn't die until more than 900 years later. But he died spiritually the moment he disobeyed. As soon as he ate that fruit, he was separated from God because death is separation. 
uh, if you think about the parable of the prodigal son, when the younger son returned, the father said to the older son, for this my son was dead and he's alive again. Now he wasn't dead physically, but he had been separated from his father and that was also considered to be death. And Jesus said to Martha, I'm the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. Again, this dead means death spiritually, separation from God. And man died spiritual the moment he ate. That's the reason he ran away from God, and that's the reason he tried to cover himself with fig leaves. Um, and then verse 20, Adam called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all living. Uh, he had already named the animals, and then he also named his wife. Aren't you glad he named her Eve instead of hippopotamus or something? <laughs> um, but Eve in the Hebrew is means life. Um, and then 21, the Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife and clothed them. Mm -hmm. So in order to have the skins of animals, the animals had to be killed. This was our, the first sacrifice. God rejected their fig leaves but made them coverings of skin. And when Adam and Eve left the Garden of Eden, they looked back upon a bloody sacrifice. And when they looked back, they saw exactly what God had Moses put on the mercy seat in the Holy of Holies. Two cherubim looking down upon the blood that was there, and that was the way to God. The shedding of Jesus' blood is the way to God for us. Uh, and there are four lessons that we can see from the fig leaves and the fact that God clothed them with skins. One, man must have an adequate covering to approach God. You cannot come to God on the basis of your good works. What does he call our good works? Filthy rags. Filthy rags. <laughs> you must come as you are, a sinner. Two, fig leaves are unacceptable because they are homemade. God does not take a homemade garment. Three, God must provide the covering. And four, the covering is obtained only through the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. Man must have a substitute between himself and God's wrath. And Jesus is our substitute. And there was this beautiful poem here. He prayed for strength that he might achieve. He was made weak, weak that he might obey. He prayed for help that he might do greater things. He was given infirmity that he might do better things. He prayed for riches that he might be happy. He was given poverty that he might be wise. He prayed for power that he might have the praise of men. He was given infirmity that he might feel the need of God. He prayed for all things that he might enjoy life. He was given life that he might enjoy all things. He had received nothing that he asked for, but his prayer was answered and he was most blessed. God always answers our prayers, doesn't he? May not be in the way that you want, may not be what you expected, but God is going to answer in the best way, the ways that's best for you and that what is according to his will. So salvation comes when you and I take our proper place as sinners before God. Uh, we need to admit that we're sinners, we need to confess our sin, and we need to repent of our sin. And that way we're dealing with it instead of just covering it up. Uh, and then verses 22 and 23, And the Lord God said, The man has now become like one of us, knowing good and evil. He must not be allowed to reach out his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat and live forever. So the Lord God banished him from the Garden of Eden to work the ground from which he had been taken. Their sin had brought upon them the judgment of God, and the only punishment of such high treason is eternal death. Then God put into play a system by which human beings could find pardon for sin. God killed an animal and made garments for the man and woman to cover the nakedness that now brought them shame. And in doing so, God planted a picture of what he would do thousands of years later when the perfect lamb was slain to take away the, the sin. And that goes back to talking about the first um, sacrifice. But after the fall of man, God drove Adam and Eve out of the garden and placed a cherub to guard the entrance. And this is so that Adam and Eve could not return and possibly eat from the tree of life and live forever in their cursed state. Adam and Eve could not stay in the Garden of Eden because it was no longer for them. And for one thing, God would not allow them to eat of the tree of life and gain physical immortality in their state of spiritual death and sin. To be trapped in a perpetual state of death and separation would be truly cruel. Thank God that he did not let man live eternally in sin, and God is not going to let us do that. 
and in verse 24, after he drove the man out, he placed on the east side of the Garden of Eden cherubim and a flaming sword flashing back and forth to guard the way to the tree of life. So God banished mankind from the garden and assigned an angel to guard the way to the tree of life. Now, this doesn't mean that God put up a roadblock, but the way of life was kept open for man to come to God, but now that way is not through the tree of life. Salvation must come through a sacrifice, and when man looked back, the blood of sacrifice is what he saw. Um, so that's what happened to change this beautiful, perfect world into what we got now. Um, and then chapter 4, uh, beginning in chapter 4, we're going to start seeing the results of the, uh, the sin that was unleashed in chapter 3. So I hope everybody will be here for chapter 4 next week. Mm -hmm. uh, and I hope you have a wonderful week.